the things that you always wanted, the people, the tribe, the passion, the things that you always crave for, it will come to you through those unknown paths. That's where the magic lies. Hello and welcome to Graduate Theory. Today's guest is employee number 19 at the seed stage tech startup Relevance AI. She's previously connected with and hosted events with the thought leaders such as Sahil Lavingia and Sahil Bloom. Uh, since moving to Sydney earlier this year, she started a micro grant fund for side projects and made connections with many people right across the tech industry. She's recently started her own newsletter aiming to curate lessons from thought leaders and tech news. Please welcome to the show today, Alaha Gagani. Thanks so much for that lovely intro. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me, James. <laughs> Fantastic to have you on the show today, Alaha. I'd love to dive in uh, and start talking about some of your experience in networking and kind of building your network from a place where uh, you kind of have a clean slate to start off with. And so what I'm talking about there is you moved from Melbourne to Sydney, uh, if, if that's right. And yeah, I'd love to talk about what um, your experience there and kind of what led to your move uh, there in the first place. Yeah, I'll have to take you back to back to the pandemic two years ago at 2020 when I was in my last year at uni. Um, I had like a, this big realization that oh my God, like I don't really have much close friends. I think the world was hit by this like pandemic and everyone was inside. And we had like a lot of time to just reflect and think about our lives and major decisions. And as I was going through uh, 2020, it was a very painful time because I kind of realized that I only have like one or two close friends um, that I see at uni, um, that we see each other every three months to six months. Um, so my soul was craving this like connection with like finding my own tribe of like-minded people and all that stuff. So I really took 2020, um, which was a peak of the COVID to really reflect on what I want out of relationships and friendships in my life. Um, Fast forward to the next year, 2021, that's when early work came in, right? That's when early work community Slack mm -hmm. debuted, which was a community of Slack for, um, you know, early workers or people in tech or who are passionate about everything that we want. So I was one of the subscribers for early work. And one day they announced they're starting this like Slack um, to meet other like-minded people in tech. And I just jumped on it and I was like, whoa, this sounds so exciting. I would love to like meet my tribe. And that just opened up a whole new world to me, right? It's like, whoa, all of these people, like there was an intro channel uh, in the beginning and I was looking and reading everyone's like intro and background, their experiences. I was like, whoa, there's like whole other world and perspectives and experiences out there that I wasn't sure of. Um, so right away with the Slack community, as I was back in Melbourne, and this was a very like Sydney focused kind of like Slack. So I started to contribute as much as possible I used to like kind of help with event side of things, kind of help the co-founders with giving feedback with the community. So I just start to like give, give, give. And as you're contributing in this kind of community, people start to get to know you and see you everywhere and all the channels and how helpful you are. And that kind of helped me build some friendships online. So that was like a really mm -hmm. good tip. If anyone wants to start like building their network or kind of connect with people, find friends, like start to just give freely and follow your curiosity. Where is it taking you? Is it taking to a particular group, um, any particular interest and just like start contributing? Um, so that's where I mess, met most of my friends. But then the Startmate Fellowship also started while I was graduating uni. So Startmate had this student fellowship um, for getting students into startup, um, get exposure to startup and tech. And that's where I, that's that opened up a whole new world as well. That's where you meet other people who are ambitious, passionate about building something. And I took that as an opportunity to kind of like take initiatives, like throw a workshop. But one of the biggest takeaways or one of the biggest things that I did um, during the Start Me Fellowship was to build a book club. So one day I just wanted to read this book and I was like, it would be so fun to just like share my knowledge with others. So I was like, and I just threw in one of the channels. I was like, hey guys, I am, I want to start a book club and I'm reading this book. Who wants in? And like everyone like just got interested and like got attracted <laughs> to that. <laughs> so we, yeah, I remember funny. this was 2021 and the pandemic was still like, we all were like home. Um, there was like, I think there were a lot of like restrictions happening. And I was back in Melbourne. 
Um, so I did the online book club online on Zoom and we had like a weekly catch up on books and interest where we shared the, our favorite articles, our favorite books and had a discussion. And that's where I met, I would say, 80 percent of my friends, because, you know, with clubs, like you're forced to like see each other time to time. It's not just like a one time thing. It's like you want to see each other more than once. So that's where I would say I built most of my friends online and they were mostly based in Sydney. So I already had my network in Sydney just by being in Melbourne. But I was just like contributing with the um, like mingling with the Sydney community tech. Um, and then by that time, I got my role at Relevance AI as an ops, which was based in Sydney. So I made the move to Sydney. I already had my little bubble of network online that I came with. But one day I was just like, I was just like, there has to be more. I want to like, I was in a very adventurous mood and I was very curious. <laughs> I was like, I'm in my tech bubble. I'm in my tech little group on Slack and all these start my fellowship. I know these people. Um, and, but I wonder who else is out there that I can be exposed to. Um, so one day I jumped on Twitter. I wanted to go for brunch and none of, none of my friends who I knew were available. So I was like, Hey guys, I'm new to Sydney. I am throwing this brunch on Sunday at 11 AM. Who wants to come? And that tweet just blew up. It like got like 60 wow. plus likes and retweets. And through that, I got to meet, uh, have a brunch with 10 people through Twitter. And most of them were like faceless profile that were like, hey, I, yeah. I want to come to your brunch. And I was in a very adventurous mode. Uh, so I was like, yeah, just, yeah, say yes. <laughs> I just said yes to everything. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and we ended up meeting up for brunch. And to this day, I'm still friends with all of them. Like I even work with one of them, Shilpa, who's head of ops, like we're collaborating on newsletters and stuff. So through mm -hmm. that, through just like being curious and saying yes and feeling adventures, um, that's how I got to like meet all of these people. And right now, what I'm trying to do is hold like a monthly meetups called Meet New Friends in Tech, where I get to connect people that I already know with new people in the scene. So. That's how I'm continuing building and connecting with people and relationship building as we go. Um, so that's my story. Yeah, <laughs> amazing. Uh, that's super cool. And it's it's really, I think, a key part of all this is like, you know, showing the initiative and stuff to kind of do these things because uh, it's almost like, you know, people talk about like building this sort of luck mm -hmm. um, surface area, right? And, and, and some of these kinds of things maybe some element of luck there like the tweet blowing up for example mm -hmm. or whatever but you know you kind of have to put yourself in the ring and like even suggest to do these things or like this kind of serendipity uh you know to occur and so i think that's super cool because yeah there's definitely a thread there of like all these different things that you've done have really come from you you're putting yourself out there and saying like well i'd really love if this this like existed <laughs> and then it's just like okay i want to know how to do it and then you know like the book club for example absolutely um, and i think what people like undervalue in relationship building is that initiative like it does take initiative taking it does take getting out of your comfort zone and reaching out to other people and being proactive um because relationship building is really a long-term game um and it takes investment so and that requires a lot of action. So if you want to meet yeah. others, follow your curiosity, take initiative, and yeah, just go ahead with that. Mm. It's all right. Yeah, definitely. No, and, I, and I think like if you, I, I think these kinds of things where you're almost creating, like uh, I've heard, I don't know if you've ever read um, the book called Never Eat Alone mm. by um, Keith yeah. Ferrazzi, but th there's like, he, he's like quite good at this kind of thing. And he, one uh, one thing that he talks about is like the idea of like, and this is something that you've done well, like sort of, I guess, without knowing, <laughs> but, or at least maybe you've just come to the same conclusion as, as him. But there's this idea of like a container event where you have, you you create. So, for example, the brunch would be an example of that, where you say, "I'm going to brunch," and then like whoever wants to come can kind of come along, and there's no like expectation, like you don't have to go. But like if you don't go and you see other people having fun, then it's like, oh, like I should have gone to the brunch, <laughs> you know, and it's just kind of this container where like anyone can come along um, and it's it's super easy to kind of get involved. That's probably um, what I'm also doing yeah. with my meetups. Like, guys, come. Yeah, come. Yeah. That'd be good. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. And I think that's super cool because it's like it's just so open and and really because uh, it's even it's good for you because you're kind of bringing all these people together, but it's good for other people to come and meet 
the other people that are there, you know, perhaps meet people that they already yeah. know, connect with people that they haven't met before. It's also like very smart, right? If you're the organizer, like that's how people will be drawn to you and like actually come mm. to you to get to know you <laughs> instead of like you get into yeah, yeah, like yeah. kind of reaching out, DMing everyone. It's like, it's a good hack. Like just be the organizer and that's how you yeah, get to yeah. know people and people get to know you. But yeah, good points. Yeah, yeah. A hundred percent. No, I agree with that. One thing I want to ask you as well is like, so this is kind of a cool thing for like meeting friends and kind of people, let's say in, in a similar field or perhaps in a similar age kind of experience level to yourself. How do you think about connecting and, and sort of networking <laughs> with, with people that are like a, a few steps ahead? So like people that are kind of, you know, more senior or, or things like that. How have you kind of gone about those yeah, that's a great question. And something that I'm actually very timely going towards as well, because um, I am, I always am open to learning and especially for people who are, who are a few years ahead of me and already done the things that I want to do. And the best advice that I've gotten for navigating those kind of dynamic senior and junior dynamic is view them as human. Um, they're just human like you and treat them just like a friend. Um, Cause a lot of, a lot of them, they they are they are keen to help you out. They are keen to just like be friends with you and connect with you as well. The question is like, okay, how do I view them? It's not like putting them on a pedestal, like, oh my God, they're this person. How do I reach out? Mm. It's like, how would I reach out to a friend that I really respected and honored? Um, and one of the ways that I kind of navigate that is kind of being initiative and kind of like reaching out to them and also like after our catch up, coffee catch up, or if we had a coffee catch or anything, is sending sending them through an article that I thought of um, that they would be interested in. Um, and also mm-hmm. with these kind of dy- dynamics, people like that who are way ahead of you are busy. Um, so it's okay to have that space of six months to two months where you have another catch up. Um, so unlike the peers that we get to see day to day, um, the people who are way ahead of you, um, it's okay to have that space in between. But also like have touch points of like sending them articles that they've interested in. And when you think of something that reminded you of them, um, sending that, sending them a reminder or even commenting on their post and supporting them. Right. Um, Those things like that Mm. does like add up to that relationship building with seniors. Yeah, that's cool. And do you think about this? I've seen like instances online where people will have like an actual system where it's like, you know, you put the person's name in, it's like, you haven't reached out in like two weeks, like, (laughs) and this person's like a high priority, like person in the network. So it's like, you know, and you get like reminders, like, oh yeah, reach out to this person or whatever. I mean, do you like think about it like at all in that kind of a systematic way? Or is it very much just like what you were saying there, where it's like, oh, this reminded me of this person. Like I'll just like send Mm. like the the link or or whatever. Yeah. And people people usually have like sort of like a CRM, right? CRM system of like keeping in touch with people, um, which I really like. I've tried it, but I'm just, it's just hard to keep up. I'm like, I'm I'm someone who's like a very lean startup-y kind of person. I'm just like, how, what is the leanest Mm -hmm. way for me to keep in touch with people? And one of the best Mm -hmm. people that I know who are the best connectors in the scene or best relationship builders, it comes from a very place of like, um, how do you say it? Like authentic from a place of like, oh, if I connected with this person truly, then it's not, it's not, it's just, it just vibes. It's just like, there is no forcing. Mm. There is no like reminders. Like whenever, if it happens, like it does happen as you go. Um, So it's all about like authenticity and like the vibes that you feel. And if you truly feel connected, you will naturally like be drawn to like reaching out to the person again and again and again. Um, but there's mm. nothing wrong with CRMs. I, I I would love to learn how to keep up with a CRM and like yeah. it's sort of like an investment in relationship. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, definitely. Yeah, I think that's cool. I, I think it's almost perhaps can take away the authenticity to some degree if you're like, oh, it's the 90 day mark. <laughs> like I better send this person a message. I don't know. I feel like, you know, I, I feel like it's sure. quite cool. That, it could yeah, also be quite awesome. positive from a positive point of view. It could be also like a form of investment. Like, oh, I'm a busy person and I don't want to forget about this person. So let me just set a reminder to just mm. like catch up with them or have a touch point with them. Mm. But yeah, I, mm. I think one thing that it helps with is definitely having that touching point where you do see the person reoccurringly every, let's say, increments, two to three months um, to really build that connection and um, really have mm. that space. So 
it is a form of investment if you think it from that point of view. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I, I'll have to look into it because I think people have done them in like, even in like Notion or like, you know, simple like tools like that. They've kind of got their own like <laughs> CRM and that. Let me know how you go if you do uh, end up. Yeah, <laughs> I'll have to look it up. I think there's some guys that have them like, I don't know if you've heard of Derek Sivers um, before, but I think he has... He's like a, I think he's sort of like a Tim Ferriss type type guy. I don't really know too much about him, but I do know that he has some kind of a thing like that <laughs> where it's like, I think he, he like categorizes people into that they're, they're sort of like an A, a B or a C or like there's certain degrees. And then like there's certain day, like uh, maybe like the C's are like once a year, B's might be like <laughs> once, like twice a year, and then the A's might be like once a quarter or like something like that. So it's really Whoa. quite, like, quite, quite so strict. systematic. Um, yeah. <laughs> In like a year or so, when, when my connections grow, I, I might have a different system. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, true. Well, that's the thing. But then you, then you have like your container mm-hmm. events. So, like, people could still kind of, you can invite like 200 people uh, or whatever it is. Like, and, and there's no real, like, size you know maybe it's it's capped at like extreme levels but certainly you can have like quite a big one sure. <laughs> and you know you don't necessarily have to meet everyone mm. there for them to still get yeah that, but also get like touch point. even if you know like five people and you have like close friendships with like two of them i feel like that's even worth it right that's like relationship building it's mm. not about like the number of people that you know i mean great if like you have you authentically connect with them all but even if you end up with like mm. knowing two good people and like you stayed in touch with them and you see them even that's a big win in relationships right it's about the quality mm. and long-term games rather than the quantity and how many people i i can know of in terms of just names and not know their story right that's the way true, I think about true. It. no i i agree with that absolutely um well, one thing that's an interesting question is like so common networking advice. I wonder if there's any advice there that, or things that you've heard about how to approach being a networker that you would disagree with, mm-hmm. or perhaps someone that's looking to build their network should not listen to. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I would start with <laughs> not calling it networking to begin with. Reframing <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> kind of like it as connection, reframing it as making new friends. Um, or reframing Mm. it as um, relationship building. I think a lot of these networking tips and stuff, like they're great, um, but I feel like the best way to learn how to build those relationships or kind of like learn all these like networking tips and strategies is to just go out there and follow your curiosity when it comes to other people. So when you do uh, go out there, follow your curiosity with other people, end up chatting to them, naturally things will just unfold. Naturally, you will start to like build these relationships and you, you end up just using those tips or strategies that are out there in books kind of as a reference point rather than, oh, this is like the holy guidebook of how I should react, mm. which makes you very like robotic mm. in, the, in the sense that, yeah. oh, like that's wrong. That's, that's, that's right. It's like, go out there, like mm. you will make mistakes, but you will also learn from it and grow and you will grow so much as a person. And those networking advice will just be a reference point rather than a guidebook. Um, so I would say mm. reframe networking as a word <laughs> and, <just Yeah>, yeah. <laughs> and follow your curiosity. Yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah, I agree. Like ne- the word networking almost, yeah, it's almost like a transactional type thing where it's like, yeah, I'm building people that I can ask for favors and then that's it, exactly. <laughs> you know, which maybe is true on some level, but it's not really the kind of like, not really how you yeah. want to go about it. Like it's, it's, it's more. And even like, that. I even asked Sahil Bloom when we had him on a panel because he's one of the best connectors and best mm. people, person, community person. And we asked about networking and he was like, I hate the word networking. <laughs> and I was like, true. Yeah. And he's, he was also a very big proponent and how he met his mentor, um, the CEO of Apple, Tim Cook, was just being a curious person, um, just going to the mm. gym 5 p.m. or in the morning sometime and just having a chat with this person who ended up being Tim Cook and just like being curious about him. Um, so it really, when, if you see, if you look at the patterns of people who are the best connectors or relationship builders, they're very much like authentic, very much like very curious people uh, about other people. Mm. And that really opens up another door and opportunities for them in life. So it's really interesting to see that in patterns and people like that. Yeah. 
Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that story is quite good. I think, like, yeah, the curiosity is is an interesting part. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I think that's where a lot of this stuff starts. Because you, I, I guess, in uh, two, you probably don't know, like, if you are in an event, who you're speaking to really, or like, uh, you know, the curiosity. You, or you don't know at least like who's going to be someone that in six months you might be friends with like it's hard to know so the curiosity can be quite cool when like just kind of going going deep and trying to understand more about this person or what they do uh, it can lead to uh, interesting for places, sure and we're looking back like the biggest opportunities or even like the things that have come our way all come because i kind of explored my curiosity. I was like, oh, what's out there? Ooh, how, what can I help with? Oh, who is this person? What's their story? It's like curiosity is definitely one of the biggest things that kind of hits you with a luck or gives you that serendipity mm. um, as well. So it's, it's just so underrated, but it's like it opens up so many doors and opportunities. Thanks for listening to this episode of Graduate Theory. If you haven't already subscribed to the Graduate Theory newsletter, you can do so via the links in the show notes. The Graduate Theory newsletter comes out every single Tuesday morning with my thoughts and lessons from each episode. But without further ado, let's get back into it. Yeah, yeah, spot on. Amazing. Well, let's uh, change the uh, the tone of this. I'd love to kind of talk about your uh, experience with startups. And in particular, I, I, it's probably not even a, a topic change, but maybe just a different question. <laughs> you know, so you, you got into Relevance AI like pretty early on, you, you know, you, you sort of in some way networked your way into this role i'd love to hear perhaps like when was the first time you heard about uh this opportunity and then what were kind of the steps involved from from then to you know, end yeah up with a with, a, with an offer and for sure um very good topic um change because it's related to kind of curiosity so um i graduated so it goes back to me graduating uni i studied finance and management and i was kind of just exploring my curiosity so i was playing around with no code tools uh, i was just like geeking about no code and i kind of decided to just like throw a workshop of no code and i posted on linkedin and i was like very active on linkedin i was posting what i what my interests were and at that time it was no code i was like hey guys i'm trying this no code workshop and and I, I made really cool graphics for people to just like join um, the event. I was also at that time very much known for contributing a lot in the early bird community. So one of the founders, Jackie Ko, um, who's a founder of Relevance AI, he reached out to me. He's like, hey, I've been following your work for a while. Let's have a chat. Uh, let's see wow. what's out here we could do at Relevance for you. Mm. And uh, had a chat with, uh, with Jackie, loved his mission, loved the team. And I pitched him the role. I was like, hey, I, I think I'll be perfect for your biz ops role. Um, and I would love to just contribute and help you with that. What do you think? And he was like, let's do it. <laughs> let's go. Um, yeah, so <laughs> I, when I, if I reflect back on how I got this or how I broke into my first ops role, it's following my curiosity and sharing sharing it with in the public with, with other people. And people notice you. People really do notice when you do start contributing, when you are a help, helping person, it comes back to you in terms of opportunities and people reaching out for opportunities to you and you not being afraid to put yourself out there and letting that luck hit you, but also um, pitching yourself just like I did with the biz mm. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, that's, that's super cool. Yeah, because I, I think... Yeah, very uh, serif, what's the word? Serendipity. Serendipitous. Yep. <laughs> Serendipitous moment. <laughs> uh, no, super cool. Because I, I, I think many people like, have a, have an interest in, you know, getting into startups, obviously, like especially early on and at a, and at a startup that's actually quite cool and is doing interesting stuff. Um, so it's a pretty cool story. Um, yeah, how did you, when you were saying, like, okay, I'm, like I think I'd be good at this particular role, how did you think about like which role you'd be best suited to and perhaps like matching that with what you felt like the company needed at mm -hmm. the time was there any sort of process oh, good question um for me i by that point i've had talked to a lot of people about what they do like from like management consulting to like i don't know sales executive and all of that stuff um and i was trying to figure out what i'd be good at and one of the biggest things that I see myself doing was being a generalist. I was like, what's a good generalist role that would help me figure out what I want, but also that I'm really good at. Um, so one of my friends that bro broke into a biz ops role, um, I just had a coffee chat with her and kind of figured out that, oh, like 
this could be something that I'll be interested in. So let me just let me just try it out. Let me just focus. And BizOps or mm. operations is a very generous role. It gives you the flexibility to kind of work across functions and kind of like zoom in and zoom out, zoom in and zoom out in each function. And that's where I saw myself really contributing a lot of the time, especially like starting out where I'm trying to find my niche, trying to find out what I, is actually like what I'm good at. I mean, I am an all around generalist, you can say, but also I have this T-shaped kind of strength that comes to community building. So that kind of helps me like stand out um, in terms of what I can contribute. So it's all about like following your curiosity, trying different things out, talking to as many people as possible and just picking something and starting from there. And uh, ops is a, is a good way to start because it gives you exposure to all those mm. functions, just like a management consulting, right? Management consulting, you're not tied to a specific industry, but you kind of become an expert one day and next in different industries. That's like the mm. startup version. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, ops. Yeah, cool. Well, I'm curious what advice, let's say someone is sitting there and they're like, man, I really want to do what Allah has done and, you know, get into a startup at an early stage and, and perhaps one that, um, you know, is perhaps slightly competitive or, you know, it's maybe difficult to get into. If you had to kind of redo that, what advice would you give someone that's yeah, kind of going through Ooh, that same that's situation? That's a great question. Looking back, what I could have done more, I could have done better I would say if I were to give advice for someone starting today, it would definitely be first um, put put uh, put your share, share your learnings out there, like try to put yourself out there. Like if you want to get into, I don't know, let's say ops or be a generalist, start to share articles or your learnings from articles online. You don't know who's looking at your content. You don't know who is going to like give you the next opportunity. Right. But that's how you're increasing your surface level luck. So first would be don't be afraid to share your learnings or put yourself out there in terms of like what you want to do or your career aspirations and all that stuff. The second thing um, that is not as much talked about, and I call it um, kind of breaking into a role through a third door. And this third door could be, hey, you see a startup that you really like. Let's say there are an AI machine learning startup and you're like this data scientist. So something that you're good at that you can help with is coming up with a data science, data science kind of idea or project or helping them with something related to the data science. So in that situation, what you could do is kind of on a notion, go build a solution to a problem that they're facing, have a coffee chat, find out what their biggest challenge is, and kind of like come up with a solution of like, hey, this is what I think would be really best. Here you go. Here's a solution. And if you were to pick someone with a resume uh, or going through a standard application phase or someone who's like already giving you like solutions or coming up with you and being proactive, of course, you're going to choose someone who's already thinking like an employee um, and being proactive like that. So I would call that strategy as like the third door strategy. It's how can you stand out, but also how can you provide value from day zero and be like, hey, this is what you can do. Um, I can think of a story of like I, I was really wanted to break into this particular high growth startup. And I had a, and I through a warm intro, I had a um, kind of like, I wanted to connect with the founder. And with the founder, I kind of like noticed this gap in their community building side. And what I did when, before we had a coffee chat, I kind of drafted on Notion, a community building strategy for them that they could really leverage. And I just pitched it uh, when we had the chat, I just pitched it to the founder. I was like, hey, this is the gap I saw in your community building side. And this is what you could do better. And this is the outcome, most likely outcome out of this, like if you do adopt this strategy. And he was impressed. He was like, do you want to start like working with us? Yeah. <laughs> of course, I couldn't take the opportunity. But it, that experience yeah. taught me like, hey, how can I add value from day zero um, if I wanted to get into the startups. But um, caveat with this, it may, may not always work, but it does guarantee you standing out from like all these applications mm. that are out there. Yeah, 100%. I think wait, if folks are listening, Third Door, Alex Benayan, I think is the book, um, I think the third door that you're referencing there. Um, but yeah, I, I totally agree because I think that there's so many, like there's kind of this, the normal way of doing things. And in, in, in a lot of cases, that is like the most competitive, most difficult way of doing things. Like it's often the workaround or the somehow you manage to meet, mm. like what you were saying, like meet the founder or like whatever it is, like these kinds of ways. And then being able to show that your, your value and stuff 
through something like pitching them something or whatever. Yeah. Um, you know, exactly. it really sets you apart hugely. Exactly. 90% yeah. of the people will kind of apply the resume, which is okay, but your thinking should be, hey, how can I stand out? Maybe it's also like starting a side project that's related to, I don't know, machine learning, AI, that's your interest. And that happens to be the interest of the startup that you want to work with as well. And that would win over a regular resume, right? It's like someone who is mm. proactive, who is initiative builder, who has already started side projects within our interest bound. It's like those little things um, that you have done or accomplished will definitely set you apart. Mm. 100%. One of the things I'm thinking a lot about at the moment is this idea of like really having a clear vision for yourself, um, you know, what, you're, what you want your career to look like and then sort of working back. And I think... I think you've done this really well because it's like you can really see in a lot of these cases it's like I want to work here like really bad <laughs> and so here's what I'm going to do to make sure I end up working here uh, and I think that's really important to have some kind of a vision just so you can it's, it's and then it allows you to be like proactive and you can go and start doing these things because it's like I want my life to look like this what am I going to do to get there rather than just like oh, I wonder what's going to happen today, like, <laughs> you know, and kind of being a, a, a reactive instead. I wonder, has have you thought much about what, like, th that kind of planning side of things where, like, like, do you think about that a lot? Like, let's say where I want my career to be in five, ten years or things like that? That's a great question. Um, I had a, actually a big, even though I'm a very proactive initiative builder, to be vulnerable, I did have this, like, challenge of, like, setting long-term goals because i was always always afraid of like what if i fail what if i fail to achieve that goal um that would kind of break my heart <laughs> and something mm. that is that that challenge and how i'm going about reframing that is being surrounded by other ambitious people who are not afraid or very unapologetic about where they want to be in life um, i think that rubs off on you and also gives you the not the ability but gives you this unconscious permission to also be ambitious and up, unapologetic mm -hmm. about where you want to be in life for example let's say i want to be a ceo in the next five years like okay good on you how can you take the first step to make that happen right but i did have if i'm mm -hmm. being vulnerable a lot of like kind of like I had, to, I had this feeling that I had to stay small. I can't really say my goals. Otherwise, like I would fail and how like I would be heartbroken. Um, so something mm. that I'm navigating right now is definitely like, OK, this is where I want to be in the next five years. Um, how can I own my ambition? How can I own my goals and go after them? And something that has helped me, like I said, is being surrounded by other people who are also on the same path. Because um, you asked me about mentorship, but I think the most underrated form of mentorship is the peers around you that have the qualities that mm. you have, um, have the qualities that you want to have, have the goals or have the roles that are two years ahead of you that have the wisdom that you want to adopt and cultivate within yourself. I think that's the most underrated form of mentorship ever that's going to help your goal setting system in the long run. Yeah. Yeah. I, I a hundred, like hundred percent agree. <laughs> Cause I, yeah, I think like, you know, if, if you were like in deep inside, you were like, yeah, I really want to be like the CEO of like this company or whatever, but like all your friends are like, nah, mm -hmm. like, I just want to be, you know, entry, like ground level and really have no real aspirations. Then it makes it very difficult for you to be vocal and say those kinds of things. Cause it, there's no real, like what are you what are you gonna do like <laughs> you know it makes things hard but then if you're friends with people that are like gonna do things like that or they're gonna even pursue goals that are even more ambitious than what you thought your ambitious thing was <laughs> then it's it's it, it opens up a whole thing and totally gives you a lot of permission to say yeah. hey actually i'm gonna interview this person or i'm gonna get a job here or i'm gonna try and do this with my career um yeah, it think, gives you yeah. that unconscious permission to also be great to also have the space to be ambitious mm. But also, um, yeah, just all are around good, kind people who just support you along this journey of called, through the goal setting process. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. No, I, I think it's so important. So important. Um, yeah, cool. cool, 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 cool. One thing I want to ask too is like how you balance like you know this idea of goal setting and really sort of saying, hey, in in, in this amount of time, I want to be doing this and working hard to getting that because it's when you when you do have like ambitious targets and things you want to do you do need to you know be at least on some level you do need to be a little bit serious about okay i need to sort of 
really like try and do this thing. Uh, but how do you balance that level of like seriousness and drive with also like the fun? And and I wonder if this is a sort of thing that you've thought about or, uh, you know, even like how you kind of balance those things where it's having fun, but also really driving yeah, towards something. Yeah, absolutely. I kind of see them both hand go hand in hand and I don't see don't see them as separate things um one of my favorite quote is from Naval is like um pick something that is like play to you but works what looks like work to others um and something that I'm doing in my career right now and what I'm pursuing pursuing is something that's like true to my nature and authentically I'm curious about and something that I want to be best at so let's say community building and ops um I pick those because those actually, I have the most fun doing them. I have the most fun getting shit done. I have the most fun bringing people together. So even though on the outside, people say, oh, Ilaha, you're like doing a lot. I'm like, I, I, for me, it feels like play, play. It feels like fun. It feels like I could do this forever. And it gives me more energy to get to do more and more and more. So I would definitely mm. say in terms of like how to navigate that or how to harmonize both is to pick something or pick one or two things that feels like play to you. Even if your full-time job, it, it's constrained and you can't really do the things that is in your control and you love to work on, pick a side project that feels like play to you, that feels like you enjoy. Even if you don't get paid uh, or monetize it, it's like, I don't care. Like, this is what brings me joy and gives me energy. Um, so I'm really focused mm -hmm. on picking things and working on things that feels like play to me but it looks like work on the outside. <laughs> and that's the trick. Yeah. That's the trick to balancing both. Yeah, definitely. No, I think that's that's cool. And I, I love what you said there about like even doing it, you know, without any sort of expectation or without any uh, immediate reward, whether it's like financial um, in particular. Or, or, and, you know, perhaps it comes with different kinds of reward around like the joy and, and, and enjoyment and energy benefit of doing it because yeah that's equally if not more important. yeah and i do believe <laughs> that we all have unique talents we all have unique set of skills and all of that that feels like play to us that we're that we can be the best at um something that i want to be the best at is ops and community building right and those feel like play to me so going back to ambition and kind of like serious goal planning like Yes, I am serious about like being an ops person, best ops person, being the best in terms of intersection of ops and community building. But also it feels like play to me. Like if I work, if I put a certain number of hours, if I work on it, like it feels it feels joyful. It feels like really fun. So I could do this forever. So that could be a really competitive advantage in terms of like where you want to go in life. And Naval is the best person mm. to reference. It's like your competitive advantage is just being authentic to yourself and your skills. And I believe everyone has those unique set of skills or intersection of one or two things that they're the, they can be the best at in life. Mm. Yeah. That's cool. I like that a lot. <laughs> I like that a lot. I wonder like, you know, with, with all the things that you do, like with these events and your newsletter and, and Twitter and things that you're creating and, and your work and stuff, is there anyone that you look up to and, and it perhaps inspires you, uh, uh, for the things that was yeah um two people come to mind currently um that i really love to emulate um it's reed hoffman uh the founder co-founder of linkedin and ariana huffington the founder of huffington post um i know those are like the celebrity or famous figures but i believe that we live in an age of information where content from like people who are higher up or like 20 30 years ahead of ahead of us who are like doing amazing legendary things in life it's so readily available um contents are so readily available to learn from so i look up to people um like that and the reason why i look up to let's say reed hoffman he's i'm really fascinated by how he, how important even though he's this tech person he's this tech king he has, he has this venture capitalist he puts a lot of importance in terms of like relationship building and he i was listening to a podcast where he was talking about his friendships and how friendships are really important to him because it's a very spiritual way of kind of kind of cultivating or connecting to yourself because what we see in others or our friends that have the qualities that we want we kind of grow from that and become the best version of ourselves through kind of associating with other people. Um, so I really look up to him um, in terms of like relationship building and he is known as the ultimate connector. Um, 
And I think mm-hmm. he's done really good uh, partnership kind of stuff back when he was like in PayPal mafia. So, so someone who's like a Silicon Valley figure who does have the same aspirations or same things that I like, which is relationship building, authenticity, and like friendships, puts importance on friendships. Um, so yeah, I, I'm like, I'm geeking out on his stuff. I just like, I yeah. read, read Hoffman content. I listen to his podcast and absorb as much as I can so that I can kind of cultivate mm-hmm. Um, the qualities that I see in him in myself that I naturally emulate. So Reid Hoffman and the other one was Ariana Huffington. Um, look up to her because I see her as this leader, as this feminine leader who is like, I don't know, who has this like she. So the story with her was like she founded this like um, kind of like almost multimillion dollar like media company, Huffington Post. Right. Um, she worked mm-hmm. herself, hustle culture. Uh, but one day she had a wake up call to look after herself and her health crisis through a health crisis. Um, and she started Thrive Global and she's the biggest advocate. I mean, she's a very successful person, as you can tell, but she's also a big advocate on wellness, on taking care of yourself as you're going through this sort of drive and journey. And I don't really see that in many leaders. So I'm really fascinated by the way she approaches success. Um, so I'm, 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 we're really lucky to live in these kind of like in this age where people like that share their knowledge, share the way that different ways that they have built their success um, and went through that journey. So those are the two people that I look, look up to, Reid Hoffman and Arian Huffington. And if you mix them, you'll hopefully get me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Amazing. That's super cool. I think that's really interesting how you like try and almost like with Reid Hoffman, they really sort of taken in a lot of what he has to say and uh, and really sort of picked him as like, this is someone that I really want to be like and try to absorb a lot of that. I think that's Yeah, cool. and it's uh, like, I wish you could mentor me, but... But yeah. the best form of mentorship is the books and the content that he puts out. So mm. I'm going to make the best out of it. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. Well, yeah, the sky's the limit. Maybe one day you can like have a virtual coffee with oh, him or something. <laughs> or even, I don't know if he can ever, I don't know if they, those kinds of people ever come <laughs> to Australia, like for any reason. Maybe you go to America and see him. <laughs> Who knows? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. Cool. Uh, one thing I, I'd love to ask too is like a lot of times when we speak to people that have done really cool stuff, like um, they, it's often this this path that they go on where it's like I did this cool thing and then this cool thing and then this cool thing and now I'm doing this super cool thing and it's like it just is like what like nothing went wrong for them. <laughs> um, and so I'd be interested to hear for yourself if there was has been a time where things didn't go so well but ended up like working out well at the end, like where initially. It, it was it seemed like it, this was a disaster and like oh no like what's going on and then perhaps as a result of that things ended up going going fine if not better yeah. later like is there any is, is there any stories that I would mind? say like it goes back to one of my failures which was when I was uh, in the last year of my uni or the last two years I was very focused on getting into management consulting um, and I was chasing that dream of like being a big four in management consulting um, And when I look back and reflect on, and I was chasing it for the wrong reasons, right? I was doing it because I thought it was prestigious. I thought that once I kind of reached the level of being a management consultant or those prestigious role, then I will be seen as this successful person. And during university, I tried to like apply for the roles, always got rejected, like during application phase, like rejected literally. And I was an international student back then as well. So my chances of like getting into them was like high as hell. Um, so I was very mm. heartbroken going through application process with management consulting. Um, but when looking back, what it did, it those rejections really helped redirect my focus on alternative pathways uh, like startups. Um, I remember I had this mentor that I was kind of seeking help going through application and kind of like going the pathway of big four. And one day he said to me, like, Alaha, have you like considered startups? And this was back in 2019 where startups weren't cool or sexy as they are now. Mm. <laughs> Or like a graduate or uni student. I was like, I got offended. I was like, he thinks I'm going to go into startups. That's not prestigious. Um, Mm. But looking back, those rejections kind of redirected me to the path where I am today, um, which is so authentic to who I am. And it's something that I enjoy Mm. doing every day. So that's like one of my failures that kind of helped me 
switch to where I am today and get away. Yeah, that's super cool. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a nice story. I like that a lot. I, I, yeah, I think, yeah, it's, it's one of those things, yeah, that didn't seem so good at the time, but has worked out probably better than if you stuck with doing like the original thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's really Yeah, and rejection is rejection, um, right? Yeah. yeah, no, a hundred percent. That's sick. Um, well, yeah, one more question for you, Alaha, and that is a question I ask all the guests on the show. And that is, if you could think back to when you were finishing uni mm -hmm. and perhaps in your last year of uni, kind of about to go out into the world and do these things where you're trying to get a job at <laughs> X, Y place, you know, knowing what you know now and all mm -hmm. the things that you've done, what advice would you give yourself mm -hmm. if you were at that stage again? Yeah, I would say be bold, um, take risk, and don't be afraid of the unknown paths. I think for so long, um, growing up, even with the society that we're in, it tells you to take this linear, safe path. It kind of lays down this path of like, if you do X and Y, then you will get Z. Um, and that's how you'll be mm -hmm. successful. Um, and for so long, like management consulting or even like other roles, I kind of was kind of chasing those, the paths that were laid out to me because I was kind of afraid of taking risk. I was afraid of the unknown mm -hmm. paths because um, if you do take unknown paths, like let's say a startup or entrepreneurship, like you don't know what lies ahead in five, 10 years. It's kind of unknown and very risky. So if I were to look back and uh, look at my younger self going through kind of graduate or university, I would say take risk and don't be afraid of the unknown. Because once you do explore the unknown paths where the path isn't laid out to you, but you enjoy it, you're curious about it, you will meet the most interesting people. You will be challenged and grow so much. And the things that you always wanted, the, um, the, uh, the people, the tribe, the passion, um, the things that you always create for, it will come to you through those unknown paths. That's mm -hmm. where the magic lies. That's where the growth lies. So that's what I would tell my younger self. Very yeah. cool. Yeah, I think that's cool. Have faith. The uh, Yeah, the magic lies in the unknown. Uh, <laughs> Very cool. <laughs> That's a nice way to finish. Amazing. Well, thanks so much for coming on the show today, Allah. It's been super cool hearing your story and, and your journey and all the things that you've mm -hmm. achieved. Um, but for people listening that want to find out more about yourself and connect with you and perhaps get involved in your newsletter and Twitter and all that kind of stuff, I'd love if you could just plug that and, and tell us. Uh, thanks so much for having me, James. Love your uh, connect curiosity. Um, love chatting with you. Uh, where people could find me is I'm usually active on Twitter. I'm close to hitting 1K. So please help your girl out. <laughs> <Hit it. laughs> I'm trying to be more active on LinkedIn. I'll be posting more content and sharing my journey in tech and startups. And you can always subscribe to my newsletter as well, where I share my readings on thought leadership and people in tech and mindset and motivation. Thanks so much for having me, James. Thanks for listening to this episode. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. If you want to get my takeaways, the things that I learned from this episode, please go to graduatetheory.com slash subscribe, where you can get my takeaways and all the information about each episode straight to your inbox. Thanks so much for listening again today, and we're looking forward to seeing you next week.